Welcome back to the Emerald Knight, Part 19, Twin Buds. When I was putting together the no commentary video for this part, and was rereading what I had written, I found myself being able to really see all of this stuff that I had written, all of this imagery, and the use of language here was, uh, there was just something about it that just, I, I could easily follow along and, and imagine, and, and it just felt really nice. I, uh, I, I don't know what it, <laughs> I don't know exactly how this differs so much, or if it differs at all from previous parts in this story. If this part is more easily understood or imagined, maybe I just really knew what the heck I was... I, maybe I just really knew what the heck I had in my mind and put it to the page. You know, I had a very vivid picture of what I wanted to see and was able to put that in words. Likewise, the language concerning Aranthus and what she's going through felt very... I don't know. I'm not sure what word I would put to it. Uh, real? Nice? <laughs> uh, it was just like I could really feel what she was going through. Uh, I mean, maybe not like literally feel everything she was going through, but I could sympathize. And in of that, it there was like a just a touch of like an emotional reaction that came out that I that I felt anyway uh, like like the sympathy like sympathetic sad pity for Aranthus in in this moment and and something about that uh, about feeling getting an emotional reaction from these words is uh, just one of the nicest things about writing and it, I, I just felt that sort of way, like, that this was, as a whole, like, this whole section, beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I'm biased, and it's my writing, and <laughs> that might sound a little bloated, but, um, I don't know, it just... I don't know. I vibed with it. <laughs> I vibed with it. And I wonder why every now and then that I get a passage like this where everything just seems to really flow well together. At least, I know I'm biased, but at least from my perspective, everything... Sometimes everything just feels like it flows really well together. The language of the, the scenery and the imagery and the language and whatever involved with the character or characters. It's difficult to express or explain how art comes out of the body or out of the mind. And I wonder if just on the day that I had written this, uh, it was just one of those days where I could write and write well or perhaps I just so happened to understand exactly, in a general sense, uh, <laughs> exactly in a general sense, uh, what I wanted to include in this passage about Aranthus. And maybe it was both of those things. Maybe I knew what I wanted and I was also in the mood for writing, sitting down and getting some good writing out. So maybe the stars had aligned. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to really talk about it. It's difficult to 
explain, express, but all in all, I did feel that this part with Aranthus was very concise and nice. <laughs> and that sort of writing carried over into this next part uh, that is about following the night. I like that we get some alone time with both of them in this part. I feel that alone time is crucial in understanding a character. What also helps in understanding a character is the narrative voice. In this case, it's third person, and it's at a remove. You can't see the thoughts going through the knight's mind, but you can see her actions and her expressions. And the language and narrative voice um, stay consistent with that. Uh, they don't go too deep in with her, uh, staying at a distance and only revealing what needs to be revealed and what the knight will allow to be revealed. I mean, the voice isn't even using her real name. And I know the voice and language is pretty similar with the previous section with Aranthus, uh, but I was more conscious of the voice in this section concerning the knight than I was with Aranthus. The part with Aranthus I was more focused on uh, just getting the facts out and like getting the tone across and getting the facts of what she was feeling and what is foreshadowing or what is about to happen with her but with the part about the night I was more I, I don't want to say concerned because I wasn't consciously at every step thinking oh how can I put the night funnel the night's voice into this but that was something that I was thinking about as I was writing it now Staying at a remove may be for the best with this part, with this section of the story, due to uh, the limited information we know about the knight and keeping it that way until we learn more about her down the road. But I do want to experiment with voice, a uh, voice that gives more than just imagery and facts, voice that reveals like how the character that we're following thinks, how they process and operate. In one of the previous parts of the Emerald Knight, one of the previous videos, I don't remember which, but I mentioned uh, Stephen King's It, and how in one of the earlier parts of the story, there is a chapter that includes the character Beverly and her abusive husband and it's from it's mostly from the perspective of her husband and I made a comment on how it felt like the story was being funneled through this character's mind like they were the ones in charge of the voice at least for the majority of the chapter to better understand what I mean by that I would like to read a couple of paragraphs from it these paragraphs are separated by a few pages and don't have much to do with one another other than the operative narrative voice. These excerpts are from Stephen King's It, Chapter 3, Section 5, Beverly Rogan Takes a Whoopin'. Beverly glanced up briefly, shook her head to indicate it wasn't Leslie, and then looked back at the phone. Tom felt the muscles in the back of his neck tighten up. It felt like a dismissal. Dismissed by my lady. My f***ing lady. This was starting to look like it might turn into a situation. It might be that Beverly needed a short refresher course on who was in charge around here. It was possible. Sometimes she did. She was a slow learner. Second excerpt a few pages over. You can't. You aren't supposed to hit me, 
that's a bad basis for a, a, a lasting relationship. She was trying to find a tone, an adult rhythm of speech, and failing. He had regressed her. He was in this car with a child. Voluptuous and sexy as hell, but a child. Barring my performance of the oral interpretation of it, from the aggressive choice of language, we can see or peer into the mind of Beverly's abusive husband, Tom. We can get a glimpse of how he operates, how he processes and, and goes about his life, at least when he's around his wife. <laughs> Even though we're not always given his direct thoughts, it's as if we're understanding how his mind works. And that's the sort of thing I wanted to, that I was conscious about and that I was uh, wanting to try and experiment with uh, in this story. At least here and there, especially going back and forth between Aranthus and the Night. As I said earlier, uh, it may be for the best that this passage or this section of the Emerald Knight is so removed, but voice is something that I would like to experiment with in the future of this story. Maybe try and get a better idea on how either character operates, even though we're not in their brain, so to speak. I would like to practice opinionating uh, each line of passage through a character's thoughts and feelings toward something or someone and through that improve my skill as a writer. Speaking of my skill as a writer, there, <laughs> there was uh, a passage uh, before this uh, that talked about the knight going to get moss for tinder. Uh, that la the language around there, as I was rereading it, uh, felt forced. I feel one can, if they look close enough, can plainly see that I don't have much experience scrounging a forest for tinder for a fire. I mean, the use of language in that passage is, uh, <laughs> it's like too detailed kind of feels that way to me. Um, it's like I'm trying to convince myself, okay, this is how the knight does it. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to logic my way to making a fire. This is just one of those things that requires more research uh, and revision so that I, as the writer of this story, don't get so easily caught with my pants down. But yes, uh, returning to my first thought about language and tone and uh, how they worked so well with one another. What I would like to add about the language, the use of language, is that, uh, which may partly have something to do with why things flowed so well with one another, is that I like to find new ways of expressing things. I don't like to see the cliché phrases uh, that have been beaten to death, such as uh, her heart was hammering in her chest, or she waited for what felt like hours. I feel like I have a duty to myself as a writer to come up with something new, a new way of expressing something. That's where a lot of that poetry, finding the poetry and the prose sort of talk <laughs> that I've uh, harped on about before comes from. But in trying to come up with new things or starting with a, a blank slate and not taking any cliches to heart, I uh, it helps to keep me interested and engaged in the story. Finding nuanced or novel ways to express something by being inspired by poetry 
and finding different ways of writing and being inspired by a story's voice are things that help keep me engaged and interested and hungry even for what I am capable of to find out what I am capable of. These are a few things that keep me going, baby. But with that being said, I feel like I've exhausted what I have to talk about in this part. So with that, that being said, I'll see you in the next part. Thank you.